Hey everyone, uh, we are now going to talk about large sample confidence intervals for a population mean and proportion. The assumption that we know sigma from the uh, previous examples is generally unrealistic. Um, now, what we could do instead is say, if the sample size n is large, then we can replace uh, sigma with the sample standard deviation s. And this is because of the following. Uh, for if we have a collection of IID random variables uh, with a sample mean x bar and sample standard deviation s, if the expected value of x1 is mu and the variance is uh, finite, then for large n, the approximate distribution of the uh, statistic z, which is x bar minus mu uh, divided by s over square root of n, is the standard normal distribution. And because of that, we can basically make the following uh, arguments. Uh, let's uh, go ahead and uh, zoom in here. I'm just gonna quickly sketch out what we would do. This should serve as a reminder of how uh, confidence intervals are computed. We can say that the probability that negative z alpha over 2 is less than or equal to x bar minus mu uh, divided by s over the square root of n, which is less than or equal to z alpha over 2. This should be approximately 1 minus alpha since, oops, uh, uh, since the distribution of that of uh, the middle term is approximately a standard normal distribution. So after we then uh, change uh, the sign of everything, uh, so we could say that this is equal to the probability of uh, negative z alpha over two uh, is less than or equal to mu minus x bar uh, divided by s over the square root of n, and that is obtained by multiplying everything by the by negative one, which causes inequalities to flip and also the signs of the boundaries to change, which means in effect that only the middle part is going to change. Uh, so this is less than or equal to z uh, alpha over two. Uh, this is going to then equal uh, the probability that uh, uh, negative z alpha over 2 uh, s over uh, the square root of n is less than or equal to mu minus x bar which is less than or equal to z alpha over 2 uh, s over the square root of n and this is found by multiplying everything by s over the square root of n then we're going to add plus x bar to everything uh, and we end up with the interval with with uh, computing the probability of uh, x bar minus z alpha over two uh, s over the square root of n. This is less than or equal to mu, which is what we want. This is less than or equal to z uh, no x bar plus no this is x bar plus z alpha over two uh, alpha over two uh, s over the square root of n. And again, because of the very beginning, that these are all equal probability statements is approximately one minus alpha, which is what you need in order to have a, a confidence interval with confidence level 100 times one minus alpha percent. So uh, this ends up being, uh, we end up in the end with an approximate uh, confidence interval, uh, x bar plus or minus uh, z alpha over two, uh, s over the square root of n. And this should work for large sample size. Uh, so that means that your sample size n needs to be sufficiently large. Okay, uh, looking at this formula, let's suppose that you were looking at sample size planning, so you're looking to do some study planning. What would you do in this case? Because uh, you don't know what the sample standard deviation is since the sample standard deviation does not exist. Right, because you haven't collected a sample yet. Well, what you're gonna do is guess sigma and use the formula that we talked about in section one, and you're going to err on overguessing sigma uh, rather than underguessing sigma, uh, since uh, if you guess a sigma that's fairly large, and that means 
like worst case scenario if you if you guess a sigma that's too large you're going to end up with a sample size that's larger than what you needed for the margin of error you wanted to achieve which means that you're more uh, precise than you specified which is considered you know it's not that's not, not that's not so bad whereas if your confidence interval is too narrow no if your confidence interval is too wide sorry uh, then that means that you're not going to be able to make the inferences that you want to make. So uh, you're going to err generally on the side of larger sigma so that you can get you can get larger sample sizes. All right, uh, example three. At the behest of management, a new sample of ball bearings was collected. This is kind of running off of examples one and two uh, from the previous section. Uh, so a new sample of ball bearings was collected this time with n equals sixty one. Uh, the new sample mean is X bar, which is 10.488 millimeters. And the sample standard deviation is S, which is equal to one point, no, 0 0.105 millimeters. Compute a 95% confidence interval for the mean diameter mu. Based on this CI, is it plausible the assembly line does not produce ball bearings of the desired diameter of 10 millimeters? All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to say uh, that our interval is 10.488 uh, plus or minus uh, 1.96 because we're keeping the 95% confidence interval which means that Z uh, 0 0.025 is equal to 0. Point, no, uh, 1.96 uh, which is of course an approximation. There's been some rounding uh, but it's uh, good enough. Uh, so 1.96 and then we have 0. 105 divided by the square root of 61 and that translates to or that's going to be 10.488 uh, plus or minus uh, 0 0.026 all right uh, so here's some R code that is doing a similar thing computes the margin of error and even then computes uh, the confidence interval by adding and subtracting the margin of error from our sample mean X bar. Looking at this confidence interval, if our target uh, diameter is 10 millimeters, this is suggesting that the um, this is suggesting that uh, our machine is improperly calibrated. The reason being, here's 10 millimeters, and here is our margin of uh, and here is our confidence interval for where the true mean mu lies. Since 10 millimeters is not in this interval, that leads us to believe that the, inter that the machine is probably not calibrated correctly and that it's not producing ball bearings with the mean, uh, mean diameter of 10 millimeters. So uh, if we had instead ha uh, computed an interval that did contain 10 millimeters, then we would say there is an evidence that it isn't properly calibrated. Uh, so, um, so we could uh, reason like so. All right, uh, confidence intervals have a close cousin called confidence bounds. Uh, we could have, a confidence bound is basically where a lower or upper endpoint of a confidence interval is set to an infinite, is, is set to something infinite. Like the lower bound is negative infinity or the upper bound is infinity. But in the end, all you're doing is coming up with some minimum value that you believe uh, describes where the true parameter theta is. Or that's the case for a comp, uh, for a lower bound and for an upper bound, you're going to be coming up with uh, some maximum value you believe theta could be based off of your sample. And there's always going to be some room for error, uh, but now you're dealing instead with one-sided intervals. So if you wanted to, uh, what you get is that the lower bound, in the case of the mean mu, when you're using large sample sizes, uh, is going to be... Uh, X bar minus Z alpha S over the square root of N and your upper bound is going to be uh, X bar well, that doesn't look like an X bar um, uh, X bar plus Z alpha S over root N uh, so just as a reminder of what these are, what we're doing is obtaining regions such that uh, for confidence intervals, we're, co we're computing a region, uh, a two-sided region where we believe the mean is. 
for a lower bound, we're coming up with a region such that there's some minimum number that we believe the mean uh, will be. Uh, and for an upper bound, we're coming up with some maximum number that we believe the mean could be. So as a quick illustration of what these are. So this is a CI, a lower bound, and an upper bound. All right. Uh, so you can imagine using intervals like these, these one-sided intervals, when you are willing to be wrong in one direction but not the other. As an example of this, uh, the stock with ticker symbol C CGM has an average daily return of 0.07% over the last 200 days, with the standard deviation of 0.8%. Compute a 99% confidence lower bound for the mean return of the stock. The rationale of this problem is uh, you would rather be... You would rather have a stock, a stock that's returning too much if your plan is to buy the stock. You would rather have it return uh, in, excess, in excess of what you believe rather than uh, have a return that's too small. Okay, so um, here's what we're going to do. Uh, the mean or the average daily return was 0 0.07. Uh, so we need Z... 0 0.01 because we want a 99% confidence lower bound. And Z 0 0.01 is going to be 2.326. All right. So we're going to have minus uh, 2.326 times 0 0.8 over the square root of 200. And this is going to end up being, in the end, uh, negative 0 0.062%, uh, which corresponds to a loss. You're saying that um, the minimum return, or basically the largest loss that you're expecting, is of negative zero, is negative 0.062% for this stock. All right. Um, uh, ha pay attention to these formulas here. These actually look a lot like uh, the two-sided confidence intervals, but notice what's different. What's different here is that instead of having plus or minus, we either have minus or plus. And instead of having Z alpha over two, we have Z alpha instead. And this is a pretty common way to go from a two-sided to a one-sided interval when the interval is equal-tailed and it's a symmetric confidence interval around its parameter estimate, um, uh, you're often doing something like what we did here, where you switch out. You're, you're generally going to have some critical value. In this case, Z alpha over 2 or Z alpha, something like that. You're generally going to have that in your confidence interval formulas, and you're going to switch out the confidence level. Uh, you're going to switch out alpha over 2 with alpha, and you're going to replace plus or minus with either plus or minus, depending on which is a, on whether you're getting a lower or upper bound. Okay, uh, so up until now, uh, we have been working with continuous data, and our objective was to describe the location of the mean mu of the data. Uh, suppose instead we are working with binary or Bernoulli data uh, and want to estimate the population proportion P as success uh, it follows from the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem is key in this chapter. That uh, the sample proportion minus P divided by the square root of P times 1 minus P over N is following a standard normal distribution. So what we would then say is we could uh, work with the probability... Uh, that p hat minus p divided by the square root of p times 1 minus p over n. This is between, oops, this is between uh, z alpha over 2 and, uh, oops, and uh, negative z alpha over 2. Okay? And that this probability should be approximately 1 minus alpha because of the central limit theorem. So we work at that probability and and then try to isolate P. We want P in the middle of the interval. 
So we would do a whole bunch of algebraic manipulations to get P in the middle of this inequality. That's going to be really hard. Uh, good news for you is that someone already did this. Um, someone already went through the trouble of doing the algebra and getting a formula uh, and, and getting P in the middle of this inequality. So here's the resulting interval. It's not easy. Uh, you have P tilde. No, oh, no, not blue. Black. P tilde. P tilde is equal to P hat uh, plus Z alpha over two uh, squared divided by two N. All of that divided by one plus Z alpha over two squared divided by n so that's p tilde and then we use p tilde in the interval p tilde plus or minus z alpha over 2 uh, times the square root uh, oh, oops I guess it's not quite that uh, the square root of p hat uh, mm, it is p hat right looks like it's p hat all right just double checking p hat times 1 minus p hat uh, divided by n uh, plus z alpha over 2 squared uh, divided by 4n squared and all of this is divided by 1 plus z alpha over 2 squared over n well that was unpleasant uh, you know, want to know when it, when it even gets even more unpleasant when we're talking about sample size planning. Uh, just a quick comment though. Uh, if you want a one sided interval for P, it's pretty easy to get. Replace alpha over two with either with alpha and plus or minus with either plus or minus, depending on whether you want an upper or lower bound, respectively. All right, now sample size planning. Someone worked out a formula for this too. It's not pleasant. It's really not pleasant. <laughs> so, uh, if you want to achieve a certain margin of error M, your sample size should be, what have I gotten myself into? Why did I choose this career? Uh, okay, so we're gonna round all this stuff up that I'm about to write down. There's gonna be a giant fraction, <laughs> a really, really big fraction. Um, actually, I'm not going to write it as a fraction because that's just going to make it even more unreadable. So, uh, Z alpha over two, uh, squared P hat. Uh, oh yeah, by the way, P hat is a guess as to what the population proportion would be. Uh, so replace those things with P hat. My apologies for writing P tilde instead of P hat. Uh, so p hat times 1 minus p hat uh, minus uh, 2z alpha over 2 squared m squared uh, plus or minus. Uh, so you're going to pick the whatever causes this thing to be big. The square root of z alpha over 2 squared uh, p hat 1 minus p hat and then times p hat 1 minus p hat uh, minus 4m squared uh, okay okay uh, plus uh, 
m squared uh, z alpha over 2 to a random fourth power. I guess it's not random, but still. Uh, divided by all of that, 2m squared. All right. Now we're done. And uh, round that whole thing up. <laughs> all right. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, round up. There we go. So round the whole thing up. Uh, that is one of the most miserable formulas I have ever seen. Uh, we could instead write set, uh, that this is approximately uh, z alpha over 2 squared p hat times 1 minus p hat over m squared, and you're going to round it up. So there's an approximate formula for this expression uh, that you could use instead because that thing is kind of a nightmare. So uh, you could use this instead um, uh, most of the time, and you'll probably be fine. Anyway, you actually have p hat showing up in your uh, sample size planning formula, which you're thinking, wait a minute, p hat is a sample proportion. Uh, I don't have a sample proportion if I don't have a sample. What you're going to do is you're going to guess what p hat is. If you don't know what to guess, use 0 0.5, since this will maximize uh, um, uh, not... Oh, darn it. Uh, hold on. So you're going to choose uh, p hat equals 0 0.5 as your guess if you don't really know what you want to pick, since that's going to maximize not m but n. Sorry, there's some uh, typos here. And guarantee that the margin of error will not exceed the samples, the, the margin of error m that you specified. Uh, this will get you a larger sample size. If you need to be a bit more economical about your sample size, maybe adjust your guess closer to what you think it's probably going to be. Um, so like, for example, if you think that, um, like the number of successes in your, in your population or your population proportion is probably going to be about 0 0.1 or something like that. You may not want to use 0 0.5. You might want to use, let's say, 0 0.2. You're going to guess larger than what you think than what you actually need, but not quite so large as 0 0.5. And if you were thinking it's actually 0 0.9, uh, you might choose instead 0 0.7, which is between 0 0.9 and 0 0.5. And um, uh, you know, just saying. We think it's going to be 0 0.9, but just to, just to be safe, we're going to guess 0 0.7 or something like that. Okay, uh, let's see an example. Jack Johnson and John Jackson are running for mayor of New York. Uh, the Johnson campaign conducts a survey of voters to determine who they support in the upcoming election. The Johnson campaign will be constructing a 95% confidence interval and does not want the margin of error to exceed 0 0.03 or 3%. What sample size does the campaign need? to uh, achieve this, well, we're going to say uh, z alpha over two is equal to 1.96, and we're gonna just round that up to two uh, to make uh, for better, or, or just to just to make the, the arithmetic uh, simpler. So we will approximate, or we will guess, uh, that uh, p, uh, p hat is 0 0.5. So that means that our sample size should be about uh, 2 times 1 half times 1 half uh, divided by 0 0.03. Uh, all of this, uh, or actually the denominator squared. Uh, which is going to be uh, 1 over 0 0.0009, except you round that up. And this is going to be 1,112. That will be your sample size. They instead with a, went with a sample size of 1,068. Here's another typo. Sorry about that. That should be just a single A. In a sample of 1,068 new New York voters, 560 reported they plan to vote for Jack Johnson. Construct a 95% confidence interval for the proportion of voters supporting Johnson. Based on this confidence interval, who is winning? 
So uh, we'll use once again Z alpha over two uh, and say this is approximately two P hat or simple proportion is 560 over 1068, which is approximately 0.5243. So then P tilde uh, is going to be um, approximately, because we've done some rounding up to this point, uh, 0.5243 uh, plus 4 divided by uh, 2 times 1,068 divided by 1 plus 4 over 1,068, which is approximately uh, 5.243 again. Uh, basically, it uh, P tilde will probably be very close uh, to P hat, depending on your sample size. The larger your sample size is, the closer P tilde is to P hat. Um, so your margin of error, oh, I think not just your sample size, but also uh, the closer P hat itself is to uh, 0 0.5. Since P hat is very close to point to 0.5, uh, P tilde ends up lo uh, looking pretty close to uh, P hat. All right, anyway, uh, the margin of error of this interval is going to be two times the square root of 0.5243 uh, times uh, 0.4757, which is going to be 1 minus p tilde, divided by 1,068, uh, plus uh, 4 divided by 4 times 1,068 squared, all of this is here, and then we divide the entire thing by 1 plus 4 over 1,068. Okay, so that's the margin of error, and this is going to be approximately 0 0.0305. So that means the confidence interval is going to be 0 0.5243 plus or minus 0 0.0305, or as an actual interval, this is 0 0.4938 uh, and 0.5548. And since 0 0.5 is in the interval, the you're going to conclude that the race is too close to call. Okay, so here is uh, actually some uh, uh, R code that will compute these intervals. Uh, the binconf function from the HMISC package is the function responsible for uh, computing confidence intervals uh, of this form. There's actually several functions. Well, actually there's several procedures, not just functions, but procedures. Uh, that uh, for computing the confidence interval for the sample proportion. This is one of those problems that uh, statisticians seem to like to revisit. Uh, they'll revisit this problem over and over again and suggest different modifications uh, to getting the sample proportions. There are exact procedures. There are, um, there are large sample procedures. There's a procedure where you add two fictitious... Uh, uh, so like two fictitious successes and two fictitious failures, there's uh, procedures where you are um, using the sample proportion just directly in the uh, standard error estimate, which is not recommended these days. I even saw a paper a few days ago, um, just just noticed it. I didn't read it, but I, just, I saw a paper of another method for estimating a, sam a, a sample proportion confidence interval. So this is something that statisticians are repeatedly estimating, uh, uh, revisiting. This is the uh, what it what what are they calling this interval? Uh, this is the uh, Wilson interval, the Wilson version, uh, which is based off of uh, trying to is isolate p in that uh, equation that we saw earlier. 
Uh, so, or that inequality, and it, it, it's it's kind of interesting that a problem like this just keeps getting revisited over and over again. Uh, so, anyway, though, that concludes this section, uh, and uh, next up we'll be talking about intervals specifically for normally distributed data. Uh, some of the methods that we'll see in the future, specifically the t coffins interval, they actually work even if the data isn't normally distributed. Although the other procedures that this uh, section uh, presents, those are specifically for normally distributed data, in which case the normal distribution assumption is quite critical. So, all right, uh, that's it, and uh, have a good day.